Welcome everyone to the webinar titled Question Answer Forum Export 101. Today's webinar is sponsored by SCARU. SCARU University was founded in 2006 with a mission to provide necessary, relevant, and continuing education to Scarborough employees, clients, and professionals engaged in international and domestic trade and logistics. Today's webinar will go over the basics of exports. My name is Allison Schroer, and I am honored to be your host today. This is an interactive webinar, and we are here to answer your questions, so please submit questions. You can do so starting now. You will find the Q&A button at the top of your computer screen. Please note that you can easily adjust your windows. Please click on the top of the video portion to maximize or minimize this piece of the webinar. So while you're adjusting your screens and posting your questions, I'll take a minute to introduce you to Scarborough. Scarborough is a full service logistics provider that has been operating since 1984. We are headquartered in the heart of America in Kansas City, Missouri, where faith, family, and hard work make for a great organization. We also have offices in Chicago, St. Louis, Des Moines, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, and Shanghai, China. We also have a sales presence in New York and Dallas. We are part of a global network of partners, which puts us in, off puts us in offices in every port in the world. We pride ourselves on local people and local presence, providing the simply the best customer service. We truly partner with our clients and ask, act as an extension to your company, making your job easier. Let me introduce you to my co-host, Chad Cluton. Hello. He is a certified export specialist with an extensive background in exports. Great. Thank you, Austin. Thank you guys for, for joining us today. And I figured we'd start off with just a thousand foot view of what the export process and kind of what even what an export is for those of you who may not even know um, or have not endeavored into that uh, arena. Um, an export is just any shipment that uh, is sent from the United States or the origin country to anywhere else in the world. Uh, could be as close as Canada, could be as far away as the other side of the globe. So. Um, the slide that we're looking at now is kind of uh, in picture form, kind of a uh, eight-step process in a very simplified manner of what takes place in the export process. It starts at your loading facility or where the freight is originating at, uh, maybe your warehouse or a separately located warehouse, and it transports via truck or courier or some mode of operation to the terminal if it's an FCL shipment or full container load. It might actually get stuffed at the load facility and then transport it off to the terminal to get loaded onto the vessel. If it's an LCL shipment, it might get transported by a courier or, or a trucking outfit that would then take it to a container freight station to be consolidated into a container, which is then loaded onto a, a vessel or airplane if it's an air shipment. Um, you can see that once it gets loaded on the, the, uh, the vessel, it then travels and, and traverses the world via air or water to wherever the destination country is and then it gets the container then gets offloaded or the cargo gets offloaded from the airplane and deconsolidated either via a terminal um, or brought by the, the, the container might be brought directly to the destination facility where it is then unloaded at the consignee's facility. Um, so who's involved in exports? What, what, uh, who, get, who, who's the, who are the parties? Who gets involved? Um, that's going to be the shipper, the consignee, their, their names, you know, they have a relationship of some sort that could be the buyer and seller as well, but they could be different. You also have a freight forwarder that's involved. Like uh, Scarborough International. Like us, the best there is. Mm -hmm. um, now, the buyer and seller could also be the shipper and consignee, like I stated earlier, or they could be two sep other separate parties. Um, and also, you have two acronyms that follow that, the USPPI. It's, which is the United, United States Principal Party of Interest and the FPPI or Foreign par Principal Party of Interest. Uh, those parties as well could be the shipper and consignee depending on the buying terms and who's all incorporated in this process. Uh, sometimes they could be uh, other parties as well. Um, and then you have the carrier. That's another party that gets involved because they're the ones who, whether it's rail or airline, uh, you know, with air transport or a vessel for, for the ocean carrier, whoever is, owns the, and operates the vessels. And then you also have the trucker who gets the 
cargo from your facility to the terminal or the port. <clears throat> so who's of all those parties, who's responsible for what? And that, that relies on the INCO terms. It's kind of a, uh, a word that some people may be scared of, some people may know a lot about, um, but they're, uh, they're, they're, there's a lot of information when it comes to that. So, Alice, do you wanna? Yeah, we have uh, this chart here, by the way, um, you'll get a follow-up email after this webinar is over, and you'll get a copy of this recording, as well as the uh, slides from today's presentation, and this handy-dandy IncoTerms Inco chart, which is uh, very popular around here. Um, we've kind of put on here, we've circled what we think is the best terms to buy your freight on and the best terms to sell your freight on. And you can look at this chart here and decide based on, you know, which Inco term you're deciding to sell on, what you're going to be responsible for, whether you're delivering, you know, to a just the port or a named place, whether you have to pay for insurance or destination fees. This can answer all of your questions. And uh, I know we all rely on this chart every day. It's, <laughs> it's a really great piece we have here. So we'll get you all a copy of it. Yes. And so as you look at the chart, you may go, well, why does it matter? Why does it matter which Inco term I choose? I just need to get it to this port. Why are all these other boxes on there? Um, well, all of those boxes and all the different Inco terms really play into the total landed cost. Um, and that can vary quite, it can, it can have a vast array of charges uh, depending on which Inco term you choose. Um, it's not really a movable figure. I mean, to get uh, shipment A from point A to point B, it's gonna cost the same no matter how you move it, or I should say no matter who moves it, it costs the same, it's just a matter of who pays for what portion of that. And as you can see from the little chart on this slide here, um, the uh, the total cost of the goods is, is $10,000, and the inland charges and the ocean charges total uh, with insurance about 11200 That's about a $10,000, or I'm sorry, a 10% uh, increase in the cost of the goods just to get it to the destination port. And that's what, uh, that where you see cost insurance and freight, CIF terms, that would get it up to the desti destination country's port, but no further. Um, after that, you have all the landed charges, uh, like the import duties uh, or the VAT, um, the merchant marine, terminal handling charges, um, even a compulsory union contribution, which sometimes you have no, they can be high, they can be low. It it's, uh, it's varies depending on port and country around the, around the globe. Um, so all that to say, that's another three thousand um, dollars. In essence, you got it all the way across the globe to the destination country for less than half of the destination charges. Um, so that can really advance the cost of the goods and how you sell it. Um, you may be able to make money in your goods going up to the port, but once you factor in all the destination charges, it can make it not so profitable for your company. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so appropriate to select the correct Inco terms so that it doesn't bite the bottom line at the end. So how do, I how do I decide to send my shipment? How do I get it going in the right manner? You know, like we say, stated, there's so many carriers before this. Um, there's truck. You can do, if it's just going to a neighboring country like Canada or, or Mexico, you can send it versus a, uh, in a full truck load or a, you know, consolidated with other shipments going the same direction in a truck. That's an LTL shipment or less than truck load. Um, or you can send it via ocean if it's a country that's not connected to us. And that's a much more economical way of shipping um, than air, um, but it's a lot slower way. There's mm -hmm. no fast boats. They're all the, they're all the same, um, roughly. They all they all go the same speed. They make right, different sizes. Right. And then, you know you have the <laughs> options of all water service versus maybe land bridge. So, you know, if you are shipping something from China to the U.S. East Coast, you could do all water service. It's going to take you a lot longer on the ocean. Um, but it's going to usually cost you a little bit less than many land bridge, which means it comes into Long Beach and then rails all the way across the country. But you have the options. You have the choices. So yeah, it's easy. that's true. And then obviously, if you need it there a lot quicker, a lot faster, you can choose air. And even there's different options in regard to air as well. You can either choose to go a, a commercial route where it's probably a little less expensive because you have they're selling ticket prices to mitigate their cost of flying or cargo, which is just strictly just for cargo and there's really no passengers flights or you can actually if it's really big or really important and really needs to be secure on its own plane you can even charter your own plane it's tend to be pretty costly but they tend to be a little more secure and you can dictate kind of the schedule as well 
Um, or uh, there's another option of railing as well. You might need to use that in conjunction with another uh, type of, uh, like usually ocean uh, shipments as well. We'll need the rail to get that container or shipment to the port at the, co at the coast if it's a long distance. So how do I choose? Well, <laughs> obviously there's costs involved, but how do I choose? How do I know which one's right for me? Well, that depends on numerous things. It can depend on obviously your size of your shipment, uh, the cost of transporting it. You may have a budget you need to stay with under. Um, you also might need to get it to the destination country by a certain date. You may have tests that need to be happen at that destination country that you have people arriving for, so that freight needs to be there. Um, also, maybe your maybe your cargo is uh, has a has an expiration date. It needs to get there by a certain date, or your cargo is no longer good. Um, you may need to expedite it in that case. Um, also, routing you may need to route it away from certain climates. Maybe it needs to stay away from hot climate or stay away from cold climate, um, as well as uh, maybe you need to stay out of certain countries because you can't pass through them or your goods are not allowed to be in that country. Um, then also, depending on your, like I said before, your packaging is, is, your, is your commodity perishable. What's inside that container? So those can all weigh into how you choose. So how do I know if my shipment's gonna fit into a container or fit into the airplane? Um, we kind of have another cheat sheet, if you will, that uh, has all the container specifications of kind of the three most common containers and, uh, and what, what you can put in them and how big they are. And also how much weight you can put in them too, because sometimes you have really big shipments that don't weigh a lot or you have really small shipments that weigh a lot. So uh, this gives you kind of a handy guide to, uh, to know whether I'm gonna be able to, to maximize my shipment details. And Kim will also send you the, uh, this you know, in the email as well when she sends the follow-up of our recordings. So be looking for that to, to help you out in the export process. Now, once I have that figured out, now if I, if I know I want to send it air, or if I want to send it ocean, and I know I want a 40-foot container, or if I have just an LCL shipment, how do I go about getting a quote? That's always kind of a, we're here for that, but, mm -hmm. but how, do I, how do I start that process? Um, there's some information that we'll need in order to help you. Uh, or to get you the, the comprehensive amount uh, of what that cost would be to ship that good. Right, right. Yeah. Um, some of those items would be on the transportation side, what INCO term you decided to choose, uh, where it's where the freight is starting from and where this, the freight is going to ultimately end up. Um, also, if there's a stipulation, if it's on a letter of credit, you might have an origin port that you need to uh, set a sale it out of or that you need to arrive at at the destination. And also, you might also you might want to tell us how, how you want it sent, whether it's by via ocean or, or air. Um, another thing is uh, also what's in the container. Tell us what the commodity is, whether it's hazardous or non-hazardous. We have to state those uh, specifications to the carriers because they have sometimes regulations on what they can carry and what they can carry, especially when it comes to hazardous goods. Um, and then if you also have the specified Schedule B number, you can also list that on your quote because that will also, it, it, not only helps us in the quoting process, but also helps us once we do the shipment uh, paperwork as well, because that will be used when we file an AES. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, also, you can, if you need uh, insurance on your shipment, you'll need to provide to us the commercial value so that we know how much to insure it for so that you have complete coverage. Um, now, other helpful dates or other helpful information, I say, would be a ready date or a, a needed buy date at the destination country. Um, or any other special requirements like documentation or licenses, or even if you ship uh, multiple, mul even if you have multiple shipments and your frequency is higher than just a single shipment, that can help us to ask the carriers if they can provide us a, a little better rate for you because you're going to be your volume is going to be higher um, to provide you a lower rate. Mm -hmm. um, also, the weight and the dimensions of, of what you're putting in that container or shipping in, in an LCL format. So some other things to keep in mind when you're requesting a quote or getting ready to, to ship, like I said before, whether, whether my cargo is hazmat materials or I should say hazardous materials or non-hazardous materials, um, maybe I am shipping to a country or to a consignee that needs the, the, the pallets and boxes marked in a particular manner. Um, they need special labels um, or special documents. Um, a lot of countries are requiring even the packaging, the wood, packaging, whether it's the dunnage that's surrounding the material or the pallets that they go on to be ISPM 15 certified. And that's a uh, big rate because what can happen is if your packaging and pallets are not that, they get seized. Right. They so, have to 
go through a, you know, be turned around and shipped back to be properly packaged or fumigated in a destination. There's, there's a lot of different scenarios. And that's something too that, you know, if you need assistance with crating and um, packaging with the proper wood packaging, we can help with that too in our warehouse here in Kansas City. So. We have good crate builders, that's yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so once I have all the information of what I need to get a quote, and I've received the quote, and I say, okay, this is what we want to do. How do we go forward? Uh, I need to make a booking. I need to uh, start off by, by letting the carriers know I need to use them. So what are bookings? Well, once the quote is accepted, we book the shipment with that carrier that you wanted to send it on, and we schedule a pickup. Um, we send our truckers in if you're near one of our offices, or if you're far away, we work with a network of truckers to get your goods. And then we deliver those goods to the appropriate either terminal or container freight station to get your consolidated in the right container um, and a couple key things to remember when you're booking if you know you have a shipment coming up book as far in advance as you can it does a couple things that ensures vessel space it uh, makes sure that we can provide equipment and get the right parties involved so this so their schedules are free as opposed to trying trying to do a last minute and you have conflicts and, and run into to bumps in the road um, and once the shipment is booked, we can always move it or roll it. If your if your uh, uh, your uh, timeline changes, we can move the the booking to a later date. Um, that's called rolling it. Or if it needs to be moved up, we can advance it um, to an earlier vessel or airplane um, or rail or, or truck. Um, you can also, if everything falls through and you decide not to ship to your to your consignee, you can also cancel it. Typically, with no penalty if no work has been started. Uh, if we don't have you know the container picked up already or if we have the freight moved out of your facility there might be some charges to bring it back but if it's not there's typically no no cost to uh to cancel that mm -hmm. um so what when i get a booking confirmation from us or when, i should say when you guys get a booking confirmation from us what kind of information should i expect to see and what should i be able to get um you'll find a lot of information on our booking confirmations a lot of that would depending on which routing you change you, ch you choose or you you, if you take an air, air shipment, you might have your air information, but um, you'll have the carrier name and the SCAT code um, listed. You'll have the date the documents are required to us so that we can file the appropriate paperwork with the carrier. Very important. Yes, because <laughs> if we don't, then, they, then the shipments get rolled or delayed, and there can be fees, there can be uh, penalties if we don't have that at the right time. Um, there's also the, the VGM. That is typically with an ocean shipment, um, what date we need to submit the weight of that shipment for the VGM processing. Um, you also have what vessel name or, or air, uh, airplane, uh, air, airliner name, um, as well as the flight or the voyage number listed, so that you can uh, list that or track that through different websites through us as well. Um, you'll have the sailing date or the departure date, um, the arrival date, and the, the, uh, at the destination. You also have the ports of where it's originating from or, or destined to. Um, and you'll, you'll even find out where it's located, where it's going to, like as far as what we need to pick up. We can pick, that, that'll be listed on there so we can find the routing information on there as well. So we mentioned documentation, what it needs to be to us. What documents do I need in order to, to not get in trouble or not have any penalties or, or, or uh, bookings rolled? Well, that depends on what kind of uh, country you're going to, depends on a lot of different things. Um, Destination countries, uh, they can they can require certain commercial documents and special purpose documents to be provided by you, the shipper, in order that, it can, that the importer can get the customs release at the destination. Um, and it's, this, it's the seller's responsibility to inform you of what they need when it's, a lot of times you're the, the shipper's responsibility to provide those to the, uh, to the, to the consignee in order so they can do that. So some of the some of the general documents you may be familiar with is a commercial invoice, a commercial invoice, or a packing list, uh, and a bill of lading, simple bill of lading. Um, some special ones that you may have run into or may not be familiar with: certificates of origin, inspection certificates, phytosanitary certificates. If you have, you know, uh, goods that need those, uh, or if you go in a country that needs fumigation, you'll need a certificate that shows it's been done that way. And if you have hazardous material goods, you'll need a material MSDS or material safety data sheet that alerts everyone in the process of handling those goods what to do or who to contact if something were to go wrong and how to clean up those goods if something were to go wrong as well. 
another note I could add on there too is if, if you need help with a certificate of origin or uh, legalized documents, that's also another service that Scarborough International can, can provide. And um, definitely letter of credits. We uh, have quite a bit of experience in working with, with LCs, so yeah. we definitely could be your, your uh, go-to for that. Yeah, we also have, in, in regards to our webinars, we have a uh, letter of credit webinar too, so if you have questions on letter of credits, check out our webinar on that topic as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about earlier, and the documents are needed to file the Shippers Export Declaration, or SED, um, or AES, there's many different names. What is that? What it, what does that entail and what's the purpose of that? Um, well, kind of like the opposite when it comes to an import shipment, we need to declare to the Census Bureau any shipment that, or most shipments that, that leave the United States. And we do that with a shipper, it's had different names throughout the years, but it started with a shipper's export declaration, um, also called or titled an AES, which is an automated export uh, what does that stand for? I'm, I'm totally drawing a blank here. <laughs> AES, we just shorted up to, <laughs> we never really, there's so many acronyms in the, uh, in the export industry. Also called an EEI, an electronic. Automated export, export system. <laughs> uh, automated export system. EEI is electronic export information. So it's had many names throughout its process. It's tough to remember fully what they mean, so we go by the acronyms. Um, when is it required? Um, well, any shipment that leaves our country that is over $2,500 and not going to Canada um, will need one of these. Um, and, and that's with any one, if your shipment has any one uh, Schedule B number that is over $2,500. You could have multiple Schedule B numbers, and if they don't, all of them, if they don't, any one of them don't total over $2,500, then you don't need to file the SED. Um, why we don't need to send them to Canada, or why, when you have an export shipment going to Canada, why you don't need an SCD, that's because Canada and America share their information very well. We don't, uh, we don't have to worry that their information or our information is inflated or not accurate um, when, it, when it comes to exports or what goods are being exported. Um, now, when is an SCD not required? Well, like I said, if it's going to Canada, um, or if a Schedule B is under 2,500, any of your, I should say all of your Schedule B numbers are under $2,500 of value. You do not need the SED. Also, if it's, there's, there's some other smaller things too. Like if you're, if you're exporting tools of trade, if you go, are going to another country to do some work and you're bringing tools with you, you don't need to file an, an, uh, an AES or an EEI on those uh, shipments. There's a, there's a lot of other different uh, small regulations that can help you uh, if you don't, if you don't, know exactly yet with your commodity the title 15 part 30 ftr the federal trade uh i'm sorry foreign trade regulation that has a, a wealth of knowledge in this in determining whether you need to or not we read that and go through that so if you tell us what commodity or what purpose your your shipment is for we can let you know whether there's a, one of those stipulations that you may or may not need to to file your eei um and also part of the sed you need to locate and definitely secure your Schedule B number um, for your commodity. Some shippers may have the HTS number from importation, but that may be different than what that commodity is listed in the Schedule B regulations when it goes out of the country. Mm -hmm. So something to keep in mind. So we mentioned a little bit earlier, or when, you, when we saw on the export documentation uh, list, there was something called the, the destination control statement. Um, and, and that is, that is something that plays into when we file the SED, if you have a commodity that needs a license um, because it's a commodity that is regulated or if it's going to a regulated country or a regulated consignee, um, you'll need to um, know more about this destination control statement. So what is it? Um, forward my slide here. The, uh, the destination control statement is something that you as the exporter must incorporate as an integral part of the commercial invoice whenever there's items that are listed that you're shipping that are listed on the, com the commerce control list or CCL. Um, and I'll read the statement out here. These items are controlled by the US government and authorized for export only to the country of ultimate destination for use by the ultimate consignee or end user herein identified. They may not be resold, transferred, or otherwise disposed of to any other country or to any other person other than the authorized ultimate consignee or end user either in their original form or 
after being incorporated into other items without first obtaining approval from the U.S. government or is otherwise authorized by U.S. law and regulations. Um, so basically that statement needs to be placed on all of your uh, commercial invoices, whether they're digitally trans transmitted to the party or you actually mail them with their originals. Um, and doing so, you need to do your due diligence when you're exporting because otherwise you could face, as the shipper could face, penalties and fines associated with non-compliance. And even if your product isn't, you know, require any CCN or on the commerce control list, it's not a bad idea to put that on your on your commercial invoice. Just have that as a as a bottom mm -hmm. clause. Yeah. That way, it's always on there. Yeah. Keeps you guys out of trouble if it's on there. So, um, but obviously, every shipper is different. So you can you can ask us independently, um, and we can help you determine whether that your product needs a license or not. So, so how do I? How do I know if I need a license? Kind of a short little, it's not by any means encompassing by in all regards, but uh, there's some questions to ask yourself to determine whether maybe my product needs a license. Um, what am I exporting? Is my, is my commodity licensable under the ITAR or the EAR? Not the EAR 99, but just the, the EAR. That, that is, those are smaller list of just the goods that may need those licenses. Um, or where am I going? Where am I? Can I ship to this destination country? There's a list um, of countries that have embargoes or restrictions that we're not allowed to go to. Um, you can find those lists at export.gov. There's a there's a, a good listing there, and they're good good help. Um, who will I, who will receive my item? Um, we have a list of parties that are considered the denied parties list. They've either broken laws or it's it's they've they've done stuff that's in the gray area. So they're on a list of parties that's not wise to ship to. Um, and so we can test um, if you know that going for, if you don't know your constant E, if you just met them out of, out of a random workshop or, or seminar, and you're not quite sure whether they're a legit business or on the up and up, we can help you check our denied parties list so that uh, you can ensure that you're not shipping to someone who's uh, not, not on the up and up. And we check it every time. Every shipment. Every shipment, every export, we check the denied parties list for all parties involved just to make sure we're good to go. Because parties can get added or taken off um, at, 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 all, at all times. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure we didn't just miss one because we checked it last week and not this week. So, um, What will your item be used for? A lot of times your commodity might not list, be listed in the ITAR for military regulations or whatever, but your product could be used or the software within your product could be used in, an, in a not so good way by someone who's not sure shouldn't be trusted and uh, you may think that your product is is totally innocent which it may be in and of itself but someone can utilize your product in a in a different manner which could make it uh, need to have a license so they can track that better um, so how do I once once we determine whether I need my license and all I have all the documents and I filed the AES and I got it to the carriers and I got my shipment how do I track it? How do I know where it's at? What do I just hope that it's made it there? And I call my constant mm -hmm. and say, "Did you get it yet?" Um, well, we have a we have a, a a broad broad range of ways to to track and to ensure that your shipment is still moving and not getting tied up and not being held up in a certain way. Once it leaves your f facility and goes on a truck or to the terminal, all all the carriers we use and all the carriers that we partner with have tracking softwares that track milestones. Um, they don't put GPS locators on your actual freight, but they do know, they notate and have uh, barcodes that they can scan that once it gets to a terminal or once it gets to um, uh, a port, they will scan those barcodes and, and record those container numbers to ensure that they can let us know that the container's there, they've notated it, it's there, they've touched it, and it's ready to move on. So we can then track through their software uh, ways that, uh, to locate where your container's at. Also, once it's on the water, people go, well, how do I know that the vessels didn't sink or not on the way? We have a website that uh, it's open to the public, but it's one of the tools we use. Um, it's called marinetraffic.com. And you'll see kind of a screenshot on this, uh, on this slide where at this point when we screenshot this, those were the amount of vessels. Um, and once we zoomed in, there'd probably even be even more. But different types, there's tanker vessels, there's container, container ship vessels, and that are traveling with freight all over the globe. And so we're able to search by our vessel name and voyage number and it'll show us exactly, usually within about an hour of where that uh, ship is located on the globe. So it's kind of a, and there's other features if you have, uh, if your company chooses to do so, you can pay and they have other features that allow you to have more information about that as well. So um, 
So in review, once I might, once my uh, shipment has gone to uh, to the destination, I know I've tracked it and they've had a milestone to know that my shipment has made it to the destination. Um, I can rest assured that it's there and once everything is good. So, but in review, how do I know what to avoid or, or is there anything else I need to know? We've kind of come up with a list of uh, the top 10 common mistakes, it, just, to, just as a good reference guide to keep aware of and to, as you've learned all this information, maybe you guys have already known this or maybe this is all new to you, but you can look through these 10 things and go, okay, am I not, hopefully I'm not committing any of these. These are kind of the, the, the big ones. Um, one, uh, I need to select the proper income term. Mm -hmm. I don't want to pay too much. I don't want to pay too little. I want to have the right amount of control over my freight with not having to pay too much. Um, selection use of credit terms. Do I know the people that I'm selling to and can I trust them to pay me or do I need a letter of credit? Do I need to go through a bank or a foreign exchange institute um, to ensure that I get my money for the goods? Um, I need to check out the export regulations compliance. Where am I sending these goods? Am I able to do so? Does my product meet their country's guidelines? Um, am I meeting, excuse me, am I meeting the U.S. guidelines to get it out of the country? Um, and that goes along with number four, anti-boycott regulations. Am I going to a country that boycotts me or my product or my country from shipping to them? Um, obviously, just recently, Cuba, we've had some regulations or deregulized, deregulations made. Um, so that those are things you, that can either open up commerce or restrict it, depending on which side of the, of the wall you're on. Um, failure to supply documents in a timely manner. Um, make sure I get my documents made up ahead of time if possible, submitted to my forwarder, um, and so they can then submit them to the care so that I don't risk losing or missing a shipment date. Um, in turn, getting them to destination as well. Yes, getting yeah. them to the proper parties, getting to your consignee, getting to their forwarder or their yeah. customs broker to clear customs quickly. Yeah. So there's no fees for, de for demerge or detention. Um, then preparing the goods. Once they get ready, once I get all the documents ready, then I need to make sure my goods can actually uh, make it on the boat or make it in the airplane and not get damaged just from, because there'll be forklifts that will pick it up and you need to have, ensure that there's some safety around your freight so that it doesn't get damaged from, from accidental uh, uh, people handling this, uh, this goods. Um, and, and what you're loading, maybe you have a specific cargo that needs certain lashing points so they can pick it up with a crane or whatnot. So, um, then you also need to document your goods to reduce the shortage. Make sure you have a great packing list. Make sure you're taking great uh, notes that you can put them into your documents so that when it gets to the next destination, there's no arguments over, oh, I'm missing two pieces, or oh, you didn't send all of it. Um, take pictures. A lot of times before mm -hmm. it leaves your warehouse, make sure you're taking pictures and store them. It can save a lot of, uh, not not all, not always does the freight arrive in the same condition it left in, but with pictures we can determine where at what point um, that damage occurred. So the right parties have to reimburse and then pay for that damage. Um, and then any overseas problems. Sometimes I'm going to a destination country and it's all great, but a civil war breaks out, or uh, there's problems at the port, a hurricane, natural disaster that could prevent me from unloading off the vessel. And my freight keeps going to another port, or uh, the the Maybe there's an earthquake in the at the destination, and my consignee is out of business for for the next three weeks, and I can't. What do I do with the freight in the meantime? So you have to pay for uh, storage or wherever. So that, those costs can add up. So making sure you're kind of aware of what's going on at the destination, and then as well, we talked about the documentation again and again and again. But it's really important. Those are the places where accidents and mistakes happen. You get the wrong number inputted, or the the you accidentally type the wrong weight and that can screw up at customs because it weight, the physical weight of the stuff of the shipment is different than what's listed on the pack list or the commercial invoice and that can really screw things up so making sure you have someone have two or three parties check over the documentation and make sure that it's uh on everything's good and there's no mistakes um that's, that's kind of a once i said that's that that's that's an overview it's mm -hmm. by no means all encompassing um we could get way more technical but we, it would not be helpful to anyway, I don't think. So. Just, to, just from the, the 101 <laughs> version. Yes. So mm -hmm. now we're going to get into the questions. I'm sure you guys yeah. have questions that you've brought. You've, you're, they're racking your brain. So hopefully you've submitted them. Hopefully we can answer them. Oh, we've got quite time. a few coming in here. Awesome. We'll Keep them coming. And I want to say up front that um, we may not have time to get to everybody's questions. 
but um, we're going to get through as many as we can. And if we don't answer your question right here, a, a scrubber representative will be in touch with you to uh, make sure we get those questions answered. Yeah. So let's take a look here. This first question says, are you aware of any resources that provide one-stop shopping for each country's specific import requirements? So, for example, documentation, packaging, tariff, code determinations, health certificates, etc. That'd be us. Oh, definitely. Yeah. We, Scarborough. <laughs> there's, there's tons of resources I'm sure you can find on the web, but Scarborough prides itself in, in finding out this information from our partners. Uh, from the carriers who are on their notification list. So as problems arise overseas or as regulations change, we're notified pretty quickly so that we can then turn around and talk to our appropriate customers who have shipments going to those areas. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, export.gov is a good government website that kind of gives a lot of information. It may not be particular to what you're needing, but uh, maybe a good starting spot. And then you can come to us and we can kind of uh, give you the exact information you're needing. Okay, let's see here. Can you clarify AES again with Canada? Uh, do you need it or do not? Do you not need it? If you have a shipment that is going just directly to Canada, um, you do not need to file the AES um, because um, if the shipment get then leaves Canada and goes to another country, they have their own way of recording all of their export transactions and they share that, that information with the U.S. on a regular basis. Uh, there's our Census Bureau and their correlating uh, <laughs> bureau up there. Um, so any any shipment, you know, traveling by truck or I guess we really wouldn't do, uh, there's probably ocean shipments, but we would, would, really wouldn't do ocean shipments to Canada since we're a neighboring country. The, the, the truck shipments do not typically need a AES file going to Canada. They do, however, need one going to Mexico. Even though they're a neighboring country, um, there's not as much sharing of information when it comes to our neighbor to the south. So we need to file the AES for all shipments going to, to Mexico. All right. Next question. We've got uh, this viewer says they're looking to enhance their knowledge base, especially uh, Canada import and export and potential changes. Well, you're in luck. Um, we have several webinars coming up here over the next few months, um, just all about NAFTA. I've got a list here of um, some potential webinars we've got coming uh, coming up here. NAFTA Trade Truths. We've got, we're going to have one on the Mexican Customs Regulations, uh, Canada and GST tax, doing business with Mexico and Canada, and border crossing issues uh, with USDOT. So definitely stay tuned, um, watch for updates on upcoming webinars. We're going to have a lot of good information coming out awesome. on those items. All right. We have so many questions, great. <laughs> Uh, is the new destination control statement acceptable to be printed on all invoices or just the invoices with controlled products? I think we kind of maybe touched on that yeah. a little bit. I mean, I, it, it doesn't hurt to put it on right. all of your invoices. It's definitely not required right, from my readings mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, Federal Trade Regulation, um, but it's always good to be safe than sorry. So put them on all the invoices. It's not going to harm anything if you have it on there. But uh, definitely keep keep uh, keep it on there. All right. When uh, shipping ETS has changed, do you need to report the change in sailing to AES? Yes. Um, after the the shipment has sailed, if anything changes in regard to the AES filing, it's not really changeable. It's kind of already been submitted to um, the Census Bureau, and they really don't. You can you can file it afterwards if there was a mistake, but they're not as particular about um, as long as it's sailing the same vessel, then maybe it sailed a day later. But if you know beforehand, if your vessel somehow needs to be changed by a week, or if it's with just to another vessel, we will be able to update that AES filing for you um, and make sure that it's still compliant. And make sure because if it's not, if the vessel information, the date is not changed. Um, they, they will be looking for it, that shipment, 
your shipment on that particular vessel and it won't be able to be found. So it's important to make sure you're compliant and we will, with every shipment we do and every AES we file, we ensure that the vessel changes and the date changes that do come about from time to time are inputted and then they're adjusted with the Census Bureau before the shipment sales or departs via air or ocean. So, And there are different regulations. Um, I didn't go over this completely, but there are different regulations in how quickly you need to file or how, how soon before it departs you need to file to make sure that you're you're compliant with all the regulations. For, for ocean service, it's 24 hours before the departure of the vessel. Uh, for air, it's two, at least two hours prior to the, 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 the airplane's departure from the airport. Um, for a truck or a, well, truck or rail, it's, it's before they reach the border of the country of the US. Um, truck, it's one hour, and a rail, it's two hours before that, that uh, mode of transportation reaches the, the border at either our southern or northern border. So. Okay. Here's another one. What about shipments that are of U.S. origin but exported out of Vancouver? Uh, who files? Well, I mean, if it's because we ship we ship stuff out of um, out of, of the U.S. Out of the U.S. But right. yes, we file we file ourselves. Yes. So we file that here in the U.S. But we have to put what the last U.S. port was on that filing. So if it's going via Detroit, yeah, yeah, Detroit. or Port Huron, that is that's going to be our last U.S. port that we list. And it will be an AES filed for rail export as opposed to ocean export, right? Because the ocean export is actually handling, being handled out of Canada, and Canada um, has their own filing system for that. But we have then this particular shipment, if the one that's being referred to in the question, is being exported via rail out of the U.S. So we would put that as the mode of transportation is a rail shipment. Can you advise? Oh, this is Kylie. Hi, Kylie. <laughs> Hi, Kylie. <laughs> Can you advise with a list of countries that cannot do business with the U.S.? At yes. I don't have that off the top of my head. I should have brought that. There's a, uh, a controlled countries list. Um, there's we can about get a, that to you. Yeah, we can get that to anyone who wants that. Feel free to uh, reply to the email that Kim sends out. She might be able to add that to the email with the, with the report. But typically there's about, I want to say, last time I checked, between 7 and 11 countries that are not, uh, we're not allowed to ship to. They're on a, uh, only government agencies and, and stuff of that nature can really ship to those. Or without government approval, you can't really sh ship to those countries. Okay. I've uh, got another one here. Um, does Scarborough handle animal health certificates? And uh, yes, we have animal health certificates on staff, or certificates, experts yes. <laughs> on staff um, that can process anywhere from you know 20 certificates on a single shipment and, and as little as a dozen health certificates a week, depending on demand. Um, it's something we're good at, and we can definitely help um, with that. Just give us a call. Uh, uh, let's see here. Oh. Do we have any special export consolidations that Scrubber handles in house? We have some of those as well. Yes, yes, we do. We can really we can ship anywhere. We can consolidate to anywhere in the world. Uh, but currently, the UK is really um, one of our busier one ones. of our busier lanes. So, if you have any UK freight, give us a call. We can definitely help with that. Yes. I make shipments to Dubai, and have been informed that I need to get the documents stamped by the local chamber chamber of commerce and stamped with our company stamp and duly signed in blue ink. Is this common? Yes. <laughs> That's a short answer, yes. yes. But we, we work with uh, uh, our, our Chamber of Commerce here as well as other documentation parties to uh, certify or legalize documentation for all different countries throughout the globe. Um, we've gone to Dubai many times um, for my particular clients, and uh, we can <coughs> certify we create certain certificates of origin um, and have them certified by the Chamber. You just let us know what your constantly is requiring of you and, and what they're wanting, and uh, we can then do the, do, do the due diligence for you. And a lot of that's based on country as well. Yes, so, yes. You know, specific countries have 
regulations where they require original bills signed in blue ink. And yeah. we've, we've got a lot of experience with that. So. And there's a question for you guys. If any, I know you can't answer back, so I'll just <laughs> answer it. But why is it blue ink that we have to sign in? Um, black ink is totally not good to sign in, but it can be photocopied and still black ink. Once you photocopy blue ink, it turns black and you realize it's not a original. So blue ink certifies that it can be original, that you're not passing off a, a photocopied and altered document that it's actually signed and you can see the actual in, imprintation of the, of the pen on the paper. Okay, let's see here. How many states have adopted inco terms and is this required in order to use that? How many states have adopted INCO terms and is this required in order to use them? INCO terms are is, is an internationally recognized you know, um, agreement, agreement. You know, on, on how you're going to be shipping your freight. And I don't think that it has to be, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, it's not something that's a, a necessarily adopted. Um, right. And as far as the U.S. goes, I mean, pretty much the whole United States uses the same you know, standard set of, of Ingo terms. Yeah. So I, anyone can use that. Yeah. No matter where you ship it in the globe, no matter where the freight is originating out of, no matter which state, it's going to follow the same Ingo terms because those are globally used. Um, now, there are certain changes, so to speak, culturally. Um, I know when we asked for a, a DAP quote in Europe, typically they the agents and countries over there include customs clearance in that fee. In, in with those fees, but in other countries like uh, in, the, in the Far East or, or Africa, that's typically not, they, they don't include that. You have to ask for that or you can find those fees out, but they say DAP does not include customs clearance, so we will not include it. But in Europe, depending on the country you're going to in Europe, that's technically or typically included in there and you, you see that kind of change a little bit. So you kind of have to, culturally there's, there can be subtle changes, but globally, they're, they're accepted worldwide. Who should I talk to about help with finding clients overseas? Um, Paul Scarborough, we, uh, we have close relationships and um, partnerships with a number of uh, economic development centers, yeah. the World Trade Centers, um, government agencies such as US Commercial Service. And if you're interested in using this as a resource, send us an email and we'll, we'll get you connected yeah. um, with, with our contacts to make that happen. Yeah, we definitely pride ourselves in making these partnerships with these organizations because they're assets to our customers. And we feel like, like Allison stated earlier, we partner with all of our clients. Therefore, your interests become our interests. And we want you to find new clients all over the globe. So we will gladly help you pick a new, a new uh, region to, to, do, to, do, to do business in. Okay. What is the difference between an SLI and an SCD? Uh, question one is needed to, you know, yes. an SCD is the shippers export declaration so that's what we're declaring to the Census Bureau um, and that's all the information from the shipment an SLI is where we get the information from that's what you provide to us in order to file the SED on your behalf um, anytime you a uh, shipper submits an SLI to a forwarder or to a carrier um, that is a kind of a one-time POA or power of attorney for that shipment in order for the forwarder or carrier to file the ITN. Typically, the carrier doesn't file the ITNs, but if it's UPS, if it's a little, little tiny courier shipment, UPS will file that ITN on your behalf. So it's always always be careful who I give my SLI to. I typically want to give it to my trusted forwarder or to someone I'm partnering with and I have a POA with them um, in order that they get the information correct and they're filing correctly on my behalf. So one is the information, the SLI is the information that we needed to file the SED. The short answer there. Okay, this uh, question is, have you ever done a class on finding the HTS or Schedule B number? If so, do you have it available on recording or will you be doing another session? I don't believe we've done a session on that, but that's, that's a really, it's an excellent um, idea. Yes. That's a very good idea. So we will we will relay that to our team out here and see what Give we can do. Give it to the people who decide what's on our webinars. Yeah, <laughs> see Keep, what we can do to get that done. Yeah, that's one thing that we want to make sure our webinars are, are informational to you of what you need. 
So if you have ideas of what you'd like to see, feel free to send those to us and we'd love to know what you're interested in finding more information about. Mm -hmm. Time for a couple more questions. A couple more maybe. Um, can you use a pro forma invoice as opposed to a commercial invoice? Uh, that is all I have access to when making shipments. So and I think that kind of um, is going to definitely depend on what country you're shipping to. Yeah. Um, you know, we frequently see pro forma invoices for things um, going to Canada. Um, Sometimes to Europe. To Europe. Um, occasionally. But it's something we might have to do a little bit more research to see where you're looking to ship to yeah. and see if there's you know, any specific requirements for that country. You might want to check with your consignee that you're doing business with and ask them to check with their broker to see if they can clear customs with just a performing voice. A lot of times that may not be a problem, but uh, depending where they're located at or what their country requirements are, they might be able to shed more light on what what we can because we'll be able to give you a lot of the the, uh, the information on how to get it out of the country with a performa, not a problem, but maybe getting it into that respective country might be the issue. So, um, yes, we can find, if you, if you know a particular country you're looking for, let us know and we can work on that too. All right. Here's another question from Kylie. Can you advise where the list of denied parties is? I don't know the actual website. Yeah, the website we have a we have a uh, electronic data transfer from from where that I can we can find that on the Antia, but uh, it it pulls into our software. So as long as we're inputting that information, we hit the check denied parties list. It pulls it in. We refresh that. Um, there's actually an individual in our St. Louis office who who updates that that part denied parties list every week. Mm -hmm. So um, I can find out from her, and uh, we can get you that information of where. Well, how to access that. So, well, we are probably not going to get through all of these questions yeah. because, wow, we keep coming in. We yeah. got a lot of good information today and lots of great questions from everyone. So, thanks for participating. Um, please note that this webinar recording will be available to you um, in a follow up email coming your way along with the presentation, like we said, some of those other um, PDFs we have on. Income terms and container specifications. Uh, please check our YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, we can really record all of our webinars so you have 24 7 access to training right at your fingertips. Um, we also offer customized training and consulting, so don't hesitate to contact us. Yes. So thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, have a great rest of the day. <laughs>